Welcome to In the ED Now, a podcast that makes you an excellent emergency department physical therapist. I'm Rebecca Griffith, your host, the EDDPT, and today I have with me Dr. Lindemann. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, I'm so excited that you're here, but tell everybody a little bit about yourself and why you're here. Sure, yeah. So um, my name is uh, Ben Lindemann, um, and I actually reside in the Philadelphia area. Um, and I am an assistant professor at Tufts University in their Seattle program um, as of this year. Um, but I was a graduate of physical therapy in 2017, um, did a one-year neurological residency in 2018, and then worked full-time at in a large outpatient clinic here in Philadelphia for the last five, six years, um, and then recently transitioned to academia. So that's a big jump. And it's kind of a quick jump because there's there are a lot of students who listen to this podcast. So I just want to start by asking you, like, how did you make that decision to leave clinical care and go into academics? And is it what you thought you would do? I always knew that I wanted to teach. And sometimes I joke with friends and say, you know, if money were no option and I could do whatever I wanted, I've always stuck to that. I've been a sixth grade science teacher, um, but it never quite went that route because of the whole teachers make five cents an hour kind of thing. Yeah. Um, not that money is everything, but I wanted to merge healthcare and teaching. And I felt physical therapy was that route. Um, but I always wanted to teach. And even early on in my professional career, I got involved in being a lab assistant and doing a, a guest lecture here or there. And then in 2021, um, I was afforded the opportunity to actually lead a course um, at an institution here in Philadelphia um, and kind of got to dip my toe into the water of teaching and just ate it up. I absolutely adored it. I loved leaving my job, going to teach and working in the labs. And it, it just was this perfect blend. It just got my, my juices going. And so over the last year and change, I was really keeping my eye out for positions and this tough job um, came open. And it ticked just a lot of the boxes that I'm kind of looking for in my life at this point. And I got offered the position, luckily, and have loved every moment of it. And you guys, do you have classes yet, or have they not started yet? Uh, this August, August uh, 2024, uh, we'll be matriculating our first cohort. Oh, that's so exciting. So there, my next question for students who are listening and new professionals and for old, crusty people like me that might be considering a change you did do a residency. I, I also have a neurologic clinical specialty. I did not do a residency. It was not as common then. There weren't really a lot of options for that. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about was why would you do that? Like, what are the benefits of being a, a residency trained specialist? Yeah. So for me, the, the journey into residency was a way to kind of have my hand held the first year, if you will. Because um, to be out in the real world and kind of be on my own was a very intimidating factor. Mm -hmm. And and so I kind of wanted just that more structured, formalized, kind of guaranteed mentorship versus throwing to chance in a full-time job. Um, and I really found a passion for neuro um, kind of halfway through school. Um, and really in my last clinical, I got to work with a lot of neurological individuals. And so it was this writing on the wall of, well, I like neuro, I kind of want my hand held. And there was a couple opportunities here um, on the East Coast to look into a residency. And so I did some digging and started asking around. And um, the impression I got was that residency is not mandatory. There are drawbacks, absolutely, but there's a lot of benefits. And at that time in my career, I said, well, I, I'm in a spot where if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it now. Because um, I felt like once I got out into a real-time clinical job, that it would be a much harder time for me personally to kind of not backtrack, but kind of go back into the academic world in a residency. So it was more of a transition from school to a residency to full time. I liked that progression. Um, and I absolutely adored my residency. There were, you know, some some challenges like any residency would would require. 
Um, but I, I look back on that time and it really, I felt like as a new grad, really put my feet to the fire and forced me to really think and dig deep. Um, and and I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Is a residency for everybody? No. I would, I would say so. It's, it's definitely a huge commitment. You have to have a love for whatever population that you intend to do a residency with. Um, and if you don't, I could see it being a very long year, year and change. Um, and it's, it's definitely something that I, I hope will continue to emerge. I know there's more programs popping up, what feels like by the second. Um, but I always, you know, I tell this to everybody, you have to look at all the factors from financially what the residency will give you because it's not always a full salary. Um, time commitment, what type of mentorship, because the mentorship can range. Um, even the residency that I graduated from, they've already changed their mentorship time, even from when I was there, and that's only been a couple of years. So um, there's no wrong time to do it. There's no right time. Um, and really, it's just as generic as it sounds. It's having a conversation with that program and being honest with yourself and kind of what you're looking for and seeing if the two match up. I love that. But you feel like it was helpful for you to help prepare you for your career. You, it was a great choice for you. Yeah, I, I look back on it with no regrets. I love that. I also do not regret not doing a residency. So I think it can definitely go both ways. But I am in a fellowship program now. So you know, you never know where your career is going to take you. Are you ready to climb atop a soapbox with me? Yeah. Tell me why it's important to be a specialist at a neuro exam, even if you're not a neuro specialist. We have so many PTs that are like, I'm an ortho PT. I don't need to know that. Oh, I just do oncology. Like, I don't need to know that. I'm not a neuro PT. I'm not a neuro PT. But let's talk about why we all have to be neuro PTs. Is this a yeah. soapbox you can join me on? No, and I have the same soapbox. And working at my full-time job here in Philadelphia, while I was a quote-unquote neurotherapist, anything that came into that door was fair game, right? It wasn't always, they may have had a stroke in their past medical history, or they may have had, you know, a chronic spinal cord injury of 5,000 years ago, right? But at the end of the day, I had to put on many different hats. Um, and that's, I think, just the benefit to being involved in physical therapy is you can specialize. And in my experience, the really good specialist, maybe not necessarily do like all the bells and whistles that you know you might think they do the basics and they do them well, and then draw upon those more advanced skills when needed. Um, and so for a neuro exam, um, whether you work in inpatient, outpatient, the emergency room, home care, take your pick, a neuro exam is just such a fundamental skill set because if somebody is having a neurological event, you know, it's, it's neuro 101, it's going to be some sort of vascular issue or metabolic issue that there's a big acute change versus a pathology like Parkinson's that may be a little bit more of a slow burn. Um, and so being able to draw upon those skills and use them very quickly, um, depending on your setting you're in, is, is a crucial skill. And I think people get so intimidated by the word neuro exam. And if you really just kind of put it on paper and break it down, it's I, I believe it's not too far off from your traditional orthopedic exam, if we want to call it that. There's maybe a few different subtleties. Um, with the actual psychomotors, if you're doing something like muscle tone or spasticity, if you're throwing some coordination stuff in there, um, if you're getting really funky and doing some vestibular, maybe. But I, I don't, I don't view the neuro exam as this daunting, you know, exam that's you know a forbidden fruit that you can't touch. Um, but if you kind of get really good at it and you just practice it, you know, it should be something that I believe anybody and everybody should be able to do within three to five minutes. I totally agree. I, every single patient has a nervous system. Everybody's nervous system is involved in whatever else is going on with them. And when we think about differential diagnosis, it's one of the most fundamental layers that we have. So tell me, if if we have patients in the emergency department, and I, and I understand you've never worked in that setting, it's not your setting. But when mm -hmm. we're talking about differential diagnosis, 
the most dangerous thing we don't want to miss is a central issue. How can people easily differentiate what tools do they need for like central versus peripheral exam? Yeah. When can our red flags go off? Yeah, so I try to, and that's always tricky because a lot of, and this is part of my soapbox, um, a lot of our test and measures, um, if you really dig back into the history from some of the original balance tests and coordination tests and even deep tendon reflexes, they're all based on just observations that were done in the 1800s. And they were carried through medicine throughout the last 100, 200 years. And so they're, they're not necessarily these 100% diagnostic tools. And so I think that's where I, on my mini soapbox, like to always clarify, your impairment tests are not these do or die, if this, then this. They should be a collection of things that you get in order to help justify something like a central nervous system issue compared to a peripheral nervous system issue. Um, I try to go for the very simple stuff that, especially with central nervous system disorders, and if somebody has potentially the inability to communicate with you, if there's decreased arousal or there's something else hindering their ability to communicate, you want those quick and dirty tools that you know, even if the person's not fully with you, that you can still get some information. So things like deep tendon reflexes, one of the most simplest things you could ever do, provide you a ton of great information. And whether you're formally up on the grading scale, if you hit that tendon and the arm or limb flies up, that's beyond normal, hey, it gives you a clue, right? Um, especially with some of our central nervous system disorders, a lot of those basic eye movement, um, eye tracking tests, again, that can give you very simple, um, information that, hey, something within the brain or the brainstem is just not, it's not there, right? Things like strength, you have a much harder time really kind of putting your, you know, your hat in that ring because strength in some of the manual muscle testing is just not super sensitive to upper motor neuron diseases. Right. Because that um, was based out of the polio population in the 1900s. So I, I wouldn't necessarily bank on looking at strength and pressing on a quad or something and saying, wow, this looks like central. So I really feel like deep tendon reflexes, ocular motor, coordination stuff. Again, if you don't feel like there's any gross strength deficits, can at least, again, give you an impression if it's a bilateral or unilateral issue. Um, but I think, you know, like I said, for most quick and dirty neuro things, if there's an acute big drastic change it's probably something vascular right and so that's where you can say all right if there's a vascular issue and i tap on tendon look at eyes things you know and just maybe generalize like hey if i just have them try and stand and close their eyes like a basic romberg what happens right and you're not trying to diagnose somebody that's not necessarily within our scope but you're just saying you know what this doesn't smell like a standard I don't know, low back pain or, you know, arm weakness from playing rec softball or something. I think that makes sense. Uh, other things that I've seen that are kind of red flags at the bedside, like wild muscle wasting, mm -hmm. where the patients don't really have any explanation for that. Um, a status change while they're working with you, any kind of seizure related activity. Uh, and you said like taking everything kind of in a group and, and particularly when like there's a noted cognitive change. So we've had patients come in before saying things like, well, I couldn't figure out how to log into my computer today. I'm like, you call an ambulance because you couldn't log into your computer. Yeah. Can't, I can't, I can't figure it out. Like I can't do it. And it turned out that person was actually, um, having seizure issues and ended up in status in the neuro ICU. So you just never know. But I think, like you said, waiting to see if those spidey senses tingle a little bit. So I have a kind of a case related question for you. I had a patient who um, the attending physician said, yeah, like if you weren't here, I'm, I would just discharge her and have her follow up because she's really fine. Like she's walking, she's talking, like everything's fine, but like she fell but she was standing on the counter, like all of this, like random stuff. She was young, like no real cause for that. No real red flags. And he's like, but I just to reassure her, I'm going to have you just do an exam. So I did probably the most thorough neurologic exam of my life and came up with 
next to nothing. There was some impaired single leg stance time. There was some like eyes open, eyes closed issues, but really nothing else. Everything else seemed fine. And so I sent her out with a referral to see a neurologist just in case, a referral to a neuro PT just in case, because so much of what we do in the ED is get people to the next right place. And so we got that follow-up all set up and I said, hey, but like, I don't know, like it just doesn't feel good. So I gave her like really strict return precautions. She ended up coming back that night with incontinence and foot drop and all kinds of other things and then ended up with imaging and had probably the largest burden of MS I've seen on imaging. So I'm wondering from your perspective, like, how are we, like, how did I miss that? And I would also argue, like, it wasn't an emergency. Even when she came back, like, it was still was not an emergent issue. But why is it so subtle sometimes? That's not fair. Yeah, no, and I, you know, I've had those those challenges too. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, I was working with somebody and I was doing, and th this wasn't an emergency issue, but someone had some dizziness and some imbalance. And I, I did my full battery of tests that all the textbooks say I should do. And I kind of looked at the person at the end, I'm going, well, I, nothing's coming up. And I showed her all the videos of her eye movements. And I said, everything's looking really great, right? And she kind of just looked at me a little bit disappointed. And she's like, you know, I, I, I hear you. I understand what you're saying. I'm just a little bit disheartened because I was, I'm kind of hoping for something. And I said, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, if, if I had something else to give you, I would. And she came back a couple weeks later um, and they found that she had, um, and I forget the term, but essentially there was something wrong with one of her vestibular canals. And I, I kind of went back and I'm going, what did I miss? Like, I felt like I did such a, a, a rock star job. What's going on here? And I think it's, you know, people are, you know, obviously the goal isn't to miss any people. And yeah, especially in that case, if you did your full neuro exam and nothing came up, like you only can do so much. And I think it speaks to just the limitations of our bedside clinical exam, right? You can do everything by the book and interpret the way you want. It's not a one size fits all, or it's not, those things aren't meant to capture everything that you could ever see. And, you know, it's not to be the Debbie Downer or the, the, the podcast, but yeah, I mean, sometimes those people eventually do slip through the cracks, but you can at least know that saying, well, I did what I could do and I looked at everything I can and it's great that this individual was kind of cerebral enough to to come back and get some help um, to hopefully, you know, kind of get started on her journey with MS. Um, but it's, I, I hear you, I'm not sure I have necessarily a, a great issue. I think in times like that, I really try to just go back to the history and say, well, what does my exam say? But then let's look at just a bigger timeline here. And, and are these pieces matching? Is this a slow burn that something has been happening She's been falling for years and years and years. Is this a single acute fall? Especially with falls, I always say not all falls are created equal. I mean, I fell down the steps the other day. <laughs> um, because I fell I'm, off a curb. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, and you just have to put all the pieces together. And that's where I sometimes I'm like, oh, you know, I'm tired, I'm cranky, uh, you know, I, but you have to say, you know what, this is for the better in the patient. Let me take the time and the brain power to make sure that I am at least ticking all the boxes to at least look that person in the face like I did with the students. I, I've done all I can for you, right? Let's refer out to, like you said, a neurologist, neuro PT, et cetera. Um, or, hey, you know what, let's just see if this was a, a one-off thing or, you know, let's check back in a week. And if this is continuing to happen, you know, we can start to talk about it a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I always say, you know, you can always add, it's hard to subtract. And if you just keep adding, 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 you know, it's not like you're missing anything or that you have to subtract anything that you've done or didn't do. Um, so, uh, I mean, I'm glad that she's hopefully getting the help that she needs. Um, because especially with MS, it's, in my opinion, the wild, wild west. It's such yeah. such a great population to treat, but it's one of the more highly variable populations that I've personally seen.
Well, and I think we are seeing more and more patients in the emergency department with flares, with pseudo flares. Uh, a lot of times we will be the ones that are actually asked to decide if that person needs to come into the hospital for inpatient treatment or not. In the past, they would just admit those folks and be like, hey, we're just going to bring you in and see if we can calm everything down. But now we know it's probably in their best interest to go home if they can. So what is it that we can do to help this person accommodate to whatever situation is going on right now? So getting those measurements in the middle of a flare, I think is also really helpful for that person's journey, but then making sure they get the right support that they need to leave. My bigger issue is like the impact of social determinants of health on patients with neurological conditions. Can you speak to that at all? Like how can we best support people who are being impacted like that? Yeah. I mean, that could be a whole talk in itself, I feel no. like. Um, I mean, it's 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 so tough. And especially in the emergency room, not that I've been there, but um, it's you guys just have, have such a challenging job of taking anybody and everyone that can come in there. And it can be the richest of the rich and the poorest of the poor and all shades, size, colors, et cetera. And trying to accommodate just that variability, it's it's such a daunting task. Um, so I, I, for me, what I can speak to is that, um, yes, there are things in certain populations that people have access to care, people don't have access to care, what that care looks like, insurance coverage, all that kind of stuff, where you live, your access education. to medications. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, you know, I'm not sure there's one specific answer. Um, I always just say, you know, whoever's in front of you, you give them the best you can, um, regardless of where they're from or where they're living. Yeah, you as a PT might change your approach, you know, I mean, I got back from the clinic today and one of my individuals um, has a sixth grade education level and couldn't fill out their forms, um, can't read. And so, yeah, I'm going to talk to that person and interact with them a little bit differently than maybe I can, uh, would with somebody who's going to win the Nobel Prize tomorrow, right? And who can speak very poetically and understands a lot of things that are going on. But it's, it's just such a crapshoot um, to try and force yourself to stretch and some days it's harder than others but you i just say you do the best you can um you try to like i said get people in contact with those resources i feel like sometimes i am kind of a pseudo case manager yeah. um <laughs> especially living in a large kind of urban area um and so that's where you know you really have to lean on those people that Hey, their job, like a case manager, social worker, um, nurse liaison, some of those people, like, like really, you know, you're not, I don't feel like I'm ever putting somebody out by saying, hey, you know, I'm, I worked with this individual, you know, they're, you know, need to get set up with insurance or their insurance just lapsed or, hey, we're looking to get access to equipment um, and really utilize, utilizing those resources instead of feeling like you have to carry the burden of everyone's struggles all at the same time. Because that's, one way ticket for burnout. And I, yeah. I felt I felt that before. Um, so that's where it really is a team effort, just despite how much of a Superman or Superwoman you think you are. I think for me, the hardest part is just when you know that there's so much more function somebody could have, so much more safety, so much more opportunity. Um, but because we have payer-centered care, they're just not really able to access that. I've had a, one patient who comes in every time his medication runs out. And when his medication that helps him move runs out, he functions as long as he can. And then the ambulance has to come get him because he can't move anymore. And then he'll stay in the hospital until we can get him restabilized on medications. And then we'll try and start that again. But like knowing that he only eats if people can deliver food to him, he can't really get the exercise he needs where he lives. He can't take the medications that allow him to maintain his joint mobility, maintain his balance, preserve his strength. Um, and then just like watching that overall health decline and comorbidities start to like stack on top. I think to me, that's the moral injury that leads to burnout, particularly for PTs in the emergency department, because we know what we could do for that patient. We know what their neuroplasticity could be. We know what their trajectory could be in that ideal world. And I think that's sometimes it's really hard to come to terms with that. Yeah. I mean, it's very, it's, 
you know, some days, and this has always been kind of the the pillar I've stood on, um, and the residency really did force my, or kind of open my eyes to this experience that, you know, this is a personal statement. I have no research to back this up, but caregiver support and the access to just help in whatever, you know, capacity that looks like. I've seen people that, yeah, neurologically speaking, should do terrible. They should, you know, be essentially bed bound, but because they have great help and support, those people move mountains, yeah. right? They may not necessarily, you know, run the Berlin Marathon tomorrow, but they just do so well and their quality of life is amazing. And then people, like you said that, yeah, the textbooks say this person should should be a rock star. But like you said, because of maybe a lack of support, lack of help, you know, ability transportation wise to get to and from, they they struggle. And yeah. it's just emotionally, it's just so, it's just tough to sometimes look at that person and go, I, I can do the best I can, but man, you are just looking at an uphill mountain and you just, you, you, you cross your fingers and your toes to hope that they get where they can, but it's, it's almost too much. And that's, like I said, some days you just walk home and you're like, oh, you know, you just, you feel like you're not doing a whole lot. And that's just disheartening. One of the strategies that I use, and this is going to sound silly because I started my career in brain and spinal cord injury and the grief of that really stayed with me to the point where it was like very heavy on my life. And I had a really hard time with like the emotional processing of that because it'd be the patient's grief, their family members grief, that like unfulfilled expectation, the tragedy of whatever they were had brought them there. Cause they were almost all traumatic. And, um, so one of the things when I made that switch to acute care, it was much easier for me because I didn't have to get attached to my patients which some people love that. Don't get me wrong. Um, and I still see a lot of traumatic things. I see a lot of really sad things. I see a lot of horrible things, but I just imagine that everybody's doing great after I see them. It's just kind of like, imagine that I'm a guest star in their life. I give them the very best I can for that particular episode of care. It's the, the episode with Rebecca Griffith in it. And then they go off into the world. I kind of seal that practice with them. I, and imagine that they're doing great. So you're not going to talk me out of that. Every single patient I've ever seen in the emergency department is obviously thriving wildly. And that's one of the ways that I cope with that is I just hope, like do the best I can hope for the best and imagine the best for them. Yeah. I mean, I still feel that that struggle too, even an outpatient, you know, you know, not to, it, we are kind of the last line of defense in, in the spirit of traditional physical therapy minus corporate wellness and all that kind of stuff. Um, and even still, you know, it's the attachment is part of why I love doing outpatient and getting to work with people on and off for shoot years at that point, but it's still a struggle that, Hey, you, this, you're their last line of defense and then that's it. Or what if they have a relapse and they have to go back into the hospital and it, it's just tough, you know, and it's, I'm, I'm not sure. The best strategy i'm not sure there's a wrong strategy per se um but you just it's that's where like i said you just that's what i loved about the residency is it exposed me to acute care rehab and outpatient so i got to at least for me look at the best and worst of every setting right because i don't necessarily think there's a best setting or a worst setting um, but to me outpatient fit and kind of scratch that itch of what i was looking for um, but I could easily be convinced that, hey, the ED and having some of those, you know, abilities to just kind of say, hey, let me take care of their episode of care and then send them on their way um, is intriguing. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. I think it would be really unfair of me to ask you what the perfect neuro exam looks like. Mm. But I'm going to ask you anyway, because we're top of scope providers here. We're practicing at the top of our scope. We're being the best physical therapist we can be. So tell me what, what must be in our neuro exam and what questions never fail you when you're trying to receive a history. Yeah. So I, in teaching, because I work at a large health institution, I took the neuro exam from the neurologist that I work with, who some of them have written the textbook on all these things, and then looked at kind of my PT neuro exam and tried to at least make some comparisons and contrasting to what 
a patient might see with a neurologist and their neuro exam and PTYs and kind of where some similarities were. And I think what was very obvious is that things like strength, things like sensation, coordination, um, and deep tendon reflexes, those were the four that I felt were very consistent across all the neurologists and all the PTs that I worked with. And like I said before, those at least four can get you in the ballpark on, hey, is this an upper motor neuron? Is this a lower motor neuron disease? You're not diagnosing anybody. And even a physician can't necessarily hang their hat on just those four. They might order advanced imaging or blood work, stuff like that. Um, so to me, I kind of call, you know, strength, sensation, muscle tone, um, DTRs, that's, that's to me like no brainer, you do it, you run through it, no questions asked. If I'm feeling really funky, this is only from funky, <laughs> I may throw in things like coordination testing and generally the subjective is going to say something. Oh, I'm, I'm clumsy with, you know, I'm, I'm writing really funny, I'm having trouble with fine motor coordination, like the patient's going to give you the answer. And if they don't, you're going to ask and say, well, how are things going at home? How's toileting? How's, you know, cooking, cleaning, et cetera, right? And they may tell you that they feel, you know, oh, you know what? I was, you know, in the shower and I noticed that I had a hard time washing my hair um, uh, or something to that extent. Might say, hey, let's just look at some coordination testing. Again, it takes you 30 seconds. Doesn't have to be anything serious. Um, and then, yeah, if it's something like in the vestibular world, right, if they're complaining of dizziness or imbalance or lightheadedness, that may trigger some of those basic things like, you know, psychotic eye movements, convergence, head and pulse tests, cancellation tests, et cetera. Um, but that's on a very sparing level. Cognitively speaking, um, not that we're speech therapists. Um, or OTs. I think, or OTs. Happy OT yeah. month. This is true. Happy OT month. Um, those people do some brilliant work, some of the cognitive stuff. But you can generally pick up with in talking with somebody, um, and even just through intake and looking at it, like, hey, you know, are they talking with me appropriately? Are they dysarthric in their speech? Or they have difficulty articulating their words? Um, are they kind of making a lot of coughing or a lot of hoarseness in their voice that may suggest that swallowing is impaired? And through, through just general conversation, you, you know, your gut feeling may say, you know what, cranial nerves may be a benefit here today, right? Um, especially if you kind of look at just the anatomy, and especially with neuro, a lot of things are vascular in nature. You know, if you just look at the basic blood supply that goes from the heart to the brain, it transverses the brainstem. And so a lot of these individuals, they'll just kind of be talking like, all right, I'm hearing hoarseness in their voice. I'm noticing a facial droop or they're complaining of just their face is tingling, right? They're probably complaining of some level of neck pain. So obviously pain should be involved in all exams. Neuro is no different. Um, and then you might just say, hey, you know what? This is smelling cranial nerve. Like, all right, well, let me have them stick out their tongue. Let me have them shrug the shoulders. Um, and so some of it is observational in nature, which is great. Um, and then bigger ticket items, you know, things like just a basic balance assessment, just watching them walk, and then always having that conversation with this person saying, hey, I just met you for the first time. Is this walk your typical walk, right? Or do you feel like you're balanced, right? And so instead of making assumptions that this coordination is impaired, that person might be like, oh, I've always been like this since birth because of something, right? Um, or, oh, yeah, I've, I've had nystagmus in my eyes for years. It's congenital. And you just say, all right, all right, this is not necessarily pathological. So I guess to tie it all back, strength, sensation, spasticity or muscle tone, deep tendon, to me, those are non-negotiable. In a just basic, comprehensive, you have all the time in the world to do a nice neuro exam. Um, and then if you're feeling like it, you know, secondary ones like cognition, vestibular screen, coordination um, can be just kind of nice supportive ones as well. Um, cranial nerves as well. Um, but then as PTs, you know, try not to spend as much time on maybe the more impairment level tests. 
But if you can bias yourself to some of those more functional measures, you know, even if it's something like a quick sit sib or modified sit sib, I should say, just basic gait can give you so much information. So I look at my neuro exam as like, yep, here's a couple of impairments I'm actually going to hit, whether it's from just adding information. I will say a lot of patients do kind of feel that uh, customer service element when you're kind of having them lift a leg and pressing on their arm and you have them look at, you know, the coordination, you know, a lot of patients really kind of look for that, I would say, and just my lived experience. Um, but then, yeah, my neuro exam, get them on their feet if they're able to and see what happens. So. I love that. I think bottom line, we're looking strength, sensation, coordination, cognition, and how they move. I love that. And then I'm going to just add on their vitals. Absolutely. <laughs> vitals are vital in every setting, especially in the emergency department. And then I think just also keeping that awareness that your patients are evolving and that they can change any at any moment, especially in the emergency department. So that's perfect. Mm -hmm. So parting shot, what's your top of scope tip? Can be any any realm of PT, top of scope tip for anybody listening. Top of scope tip. You put me on the spot here. I know. Mm -hmm. That's the point. <laughs> Um, you know, my, my best tip, wow, there's just so many, goodness. I would say, you know, from just maybe an educational standpoint, I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'll go to, no, for the students listening out there, best tip is just having an open mind. You know, I came into PT school thinking I was going to be the sports ortho guy, on a professional team and doing all the fun stuff that you see in the movies or the sh TV shows. And here I am loving neuro, loving teaching. Um, so for all the students out there, as, as much as you feel like you have a passion, absolutely respect that. But you know, the benefit of PT is you get to try it kind of risk-free, right? So take that opportunity on a clinical, maybe you didn't think you'd like, or, you know, you know, do some additional shout out hours or pro bono work. Um, Cause you never know. You just absolutely never know. Clinician wise, you know, I guess my, my, my tip is again, kind of in the same breath, you know, as much as you, you know, have certifications and certain elements, you know, it, it's such a strong selling point, but don't always forget the basics. And that's again, from seeing some of the most, you know, respected, well, rounded clinicians out there. I watch them treat, I watch them examination patients and they just do the basics and they do them so clean and so well. Um, and so I always have to remind myself that, you know, if I'm trying to get funky and make, you know, do something weirdly out of the box, I always make sure that, hey, have you done the basics first? Did you interpret them the way you think you should? And then you add on the fun stuff versus feeling like you, trying to impress somebody or show off your knowledge, just, just do the basics, whether it's examination, if you're doing some treatment, just do the basics and do them well. I think that's great advice. Well, you've been in the ED now and you're officially discharged. Woo! <laughs>